Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Medical Myths, the show about what not to do with your body. And today is going to be a bit more of a casual episode because instead of going over something uh, more current and a bit more intense, we're going to talk about medical history and medical treatments from the past. We're not going to go into every single old time medical treatment that we've we've ever used, but Oh, and we got H.R. Johnson saying that's a great intro. Thank you. Uh, I do enjoy the intro music. I, I bop along backstage before it's time to go on. Um, I've got a few old-timey medical treatments that we're going to go into and talk about the uh, validity or lack thereof of some of these treatments. And it's actually very surprising some of these that actually uh, may have some legitimacy. Um one, maybe I guess I'll start off with this one because I, I won't go too in depth on it. But a lot of times when we talk about these old timey treatments, the first thing that comes up is um, leech therapy or maggot therapy. And we like to say, well, at least we're not using leeches anymore. But actually, we're still using leeches. Uh, it's just less common. And the reason why we use the leeches now are different than how we used to use the leeches back in the day. So, of course, Way back when we believed that the four humors were uh, the cause of someone's health and state of disease, they would try to remove bad blood with the leeches and they would bleed people to death, essentially. Um, but there are times nowadays where leech therapy is beneficial. Um, I actually saw a case in ICU not too long ago where somebody had necrotizing fasciitis of, I think, their leg. And they had a plastic surgeon that was doing a skin grafts uh, to try to repair the area that was necrotic. So they debrided the the tissue. And how you do that, you have to use, sometimes you use maggots uh, to debride the tissue because maggots will only eat dead tissue. They will not eat healthy tissue. So maggots are actually really good and very precise wound cleaners. Uh, so we still use that. Um, and then the leeches can be used when you're skin grafting um, if you get hematomas or bleeding into the graft. Uh, the leeches can prevent um, that bleeding and, and help the graft stay on better. So interesting little thing that we still use leeches. Um, we actually found in the hospital when I was working that day, there was a leech that got onto the floor and <laughs> We were wondering who lost their therapeutic leeches, but they are still around. Uh, leeches are tasty, maggots not so much. Um, so some of the other interesting medical therapies that I want to go into, uh, and I want to find the right picture uh, to use for this. But there's one that, I stumbled across, and it seemed very ridiculous to me. And, I mean, it still does seem a little bit ridiculous, but there actually might be a little bit of legitimacy here. Um, so we're going to talk about something called plumbage, or extrapleural pneumonolysis. That is a word. Um, and this was a treatment for tuberculosis, uh, primarily. So... What they would do, oh, they, there's an ad in the way of my pictures. Okay, they moved the pictures down there. But um, can we see this? Let me zoom in a little bit. If you all can, here's a good picture. All the weird little pop-ups in the way. Here we go. So if you look at the top of the lung there, um, you see some round clear spots um, in the lung. And so what this is, plumbage is a historical treatment for cavitary tuberculosis of the upper lobes of the lungs. It was used in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s prior to the introduction of anti-tuberculous drugs. And basically, they didn't have a lot of good ways to treat tuberculosis, but people were dying like crazy, and they didn't really understand this disease. So one thing that they did, uh, they would surgically make a cavity underneath the ribs, and then they'd fill the space in the chest cavity 
with some kind of other material, usually ping pong balls or other types of acrylic balls, um, oils, rubber sheets, paraffin wax, and gauze. And the goal of this was to make the lung collapse, which sounded absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it sounds very dangerous. But there might be uh, a shred of legitimacy here in the mechanism of tuberculosis itself. So the reason why tuberculosis colonizes the upper lobes of the lung and not the lower lobes, it's because uh, they are aerobic organisms. So they need high amounts of oxygen and they get that in the upper lobes, not the lower lobes. And that all this is related to gravity. So um, if you have a picture of the, of the lungs, uh, you know, when you're sitting upright or standing upright, the lungs are going to be pulled down by gravity. And each of your alveoli, the little air pockets in the lungs, have to be open uh, and you get ventilation. So when you breathe in, you get air going into these alveoli and you also have some, some air that ends up staying there, some that leaves. Uh, but a lot of this happens through pressure regulation and the movement of air. And uh, the more space you have in the alveoli, uh, the more oxygen you can fit and the more air you can move in and out of that space. So when you have gravity pulling down in the lungs, you have more uh, force coming from the, the weight of the lung beneath it. Uh, that's going to get dragged down farther. And so the, the alveoli in the in the superior or the upper lobes of the lung are going to be more open to air. Uh, and that's assuming if you're standing up, if you lay down, uh, it's going to be more, more equal in terms of the upper lobes versus the lower lobes. And it's going to be more of the, the front of your chest versus the back of your chest of which alveoli are open. So this mechanism of putting ping pong balls in somebody's chest cavity uh, to compress these alveoli uh, where the tuberculosis uh, organisms are, you can essentially oxygen starve them out. And that was the hypothesis related to this. And, you know, it, it might have worked for a few people. Uh, however, there are some complications, obviously, with doing a surgery and putting ping pong balls in someone's lung. Uh, well, you've deflated part of their lung. So, I mean, it was already a part of their lung that probably wasn't working very well. So they might not be missing a whole lot of lung function uh, in, in this particular case. But you get complications of surgery, right? And the biggest thing I'm thinking of with putting ping pong balls in someone's chest is infection risk. I hope that these would have been sterilized. But I know that uh, hygiene in the 1930s through 50s was not the greatest. Um, so... I'd be willing to to bet that a lot of people had unnecessary infections uh, as a result of this particular treatment, but this was one that was surprising that it actually might be kind of valid. Uh, and we, I don't think we really do this anymore, um, but we did talk about it on my ICU rotation with the pulmonologist. So some pretty some pretty cool stuff. I think the next one. We'll go to a, a very weird one, uh, because this one, I don't actually have a whole lot to talk about, but it's, uh, it's just really funny. So the second weird old-timey medical treatment, let's imagine for a second that you are a person in Australia in the 1890s, and you have arthritis and you don't have just any arthritis you have rheumatoid arthritis so you have an autoimmune condition that gives you chronic pain difficulty moving your joints and it's very painful and you just want to get rid of this so if you are a person with this disease that nobody knows what to do about because it's the 1890s you might be looking for some kind of way to alleviate your symptoms uh and a lot of these might have been placebo uh and one in particular, I'll tell you the story first before I tell you what exactly what it, oh, yeah, Mage Grey Wolf, I think, knows where I'm going with this. So there's a person in Australia in the 1890s who had rheumatoid arthritis, and he was supposedly um, intoxicated. We don't know for sure. There's speculation uh, that he was intoxicated at the time. 
But he was walking along the beach one day with some friends of his, and they come across something that you might find on, on many beaches. I'm going to zoom in on this picture. So they found a whale carcass on the beach in Australia. And this picture is really funny. You see the, the dead whale here, and you just see this dude with his head poking out of it. So this guy was walking along the beach. He was super drunk with his friends. He has rheumatoid arthritis. He wants to get rid of it. He finds a whale carcass and is like, yes, I'm going to go sit inside of this. And so he did. So he goes and he, he cuts a hole in the whale carcass and sits down inside of it. Uh, and then his friends kind of leave and, and they're like, I don't know what this guy's doing. This is super weird. And then several hours later, uh, this man emerges from this whale carcass and says, wow, I have no more joint pain. I'm cured. And so then people in Australia decided we're going to go start this whale hotel therapy. Uh, where people with rheumatism would go and stay inside a whale carcass for uh, hours and even days at a time, 20 to 30 hours at a time, just sitting in a rotting whale carcass to cure their arthritis. And I, I don't know for sure that this doesn't work. I cannot prove that this didn't work. Uh, but... My take on this is that this is a placebo and this is just hearsay. Some drunk guy probably doesn't know uh, <laughs> the cures for, for rheumatoid arthritis. And my bet is that he was possibly a grifter at the time, just trying to get people to buy into his weird ideas. Um, but yeah, th there's not a whole lot to say about this, but <laughs> somebody at the. Uh, Australian National Maritime Museum has they have a, an exhibit on this and the founder or the curator of the museum says I don't know there was scientific evidence per se to support the practice but there was hearsay at the time that they felt better after being in the whale and it was apparently very popular and I there's really no evidence to support that this was a thing that worked but you can do it. If you, if anyone in the audience here, if any of you have rheumatoid arthritis and you want to try out sitting in a whale carcass for 30 hours, let me know. Let me know how you felt after that and if it relieved any of your symptoms. Because I'm not too sure. The next one, a couple of these we're going to spend a bit more time on because they're very, very weird. Uh, and one of them is a bit more serious as well uh, that I will end up doing an entire episode on later. But this, oh, here, this one's very, very interesting. So there was a treatment uh, for blindness. And I don't know exactly when this was started. Um, but there's an operation for blindness. Uh, called osteoodontokeratoprosthesis. And this was very interesting to look up. Yeah, yeah, we, I'm not ruling out Grifter for, for the, whale, the whale hotel. But actually, I'm going to look up when, when this was invented. Osteo. Because I actually just found this out today that this was a thing. It was actually, this is not too long ago. This is from the 1960s. And this is pretty fascinating. So what this is, uh, it's for corneal blindness is what, what it was. But tooth, so here's a, an article. Tooth sewn into man's eyeball restores his sight. And so this is still being done. Um, so this particular article is from 2017, but this treatment was developed in the 1960s. So what they do is they take one of the patient's teeth and then they sewed it into like the side of his face for a little bit to, to give it, let it grow blood supply and that kind of thing. And then they take the tooth, drill a, a hole in it, put a tiny lens inside the tooth, 
and then they implant the patient's own tooth with the lens in it into the eye. And so now it can reflect. And I'm I'm I was curious reading about this. Because I guess this is used for the cornea. Um, but it almost seems to be more like a lens replacement. I don't really understand the mechanism of this, but it does work. This is a legitimate therapy, and it's very odd that they're going to... I mean, they use the tooth to prevent rejection, but I also don't quite understand why they needed to use a tooth and couldn't use something artificial, like just use the lens. Because either way, you're putting in something artificial. So I'd be curious to see the stats on how, by how much the uh, risk of rejection was reduced by using their own tooth. Um, so here's a little diagram of this, and I can zoom in. So the patient's tooth is removed, a hole is drilled through it, and a plastic lens is fixed inside. And it's sewn into the patient's cheek for three months, so tissue around it grows around it, and it develops its own blood supply. And that's supposed to reduce the rejection. And then after that, a flap of skin and mucous membrane from inside the mouth is then sewn over the eye. And then they take out the tooth and the, and the lens from the cheek, and then they transplant it into the eyeball, and it's stitched into the surface of the eyeball to hold it in place. An opening is made in the skin, allowing the new lens to see. The new lens then reflects light onto the existing cornea, allowing the patient to see. So this is, it seems like you could just do a lens transplant or like some, some artificial lens procedure. I, I, I don't quite understand why they needed to use the tooth, but hey, it worked. Somebody got their sight back. I'm not complaining a whole lot about this one because I guess it worked. But it's very weird. <laughs> is this where the expression eye teeth comes from? Poss possibly it might. Yeah, I can't imagine like being on a, a medical board where somebody has suggested this method of, of treating blindness. Like, yeah, so so I I had this patient uh, who was blind and I wanted to restore their sight. So what I I had this idea and no, I don't have the idea to give them an artificial lens or a, a corneal transplant or whatever. Uh, I My idea, I want to take their tooth and I want to put a lens in it and I want to put their tooth inside their eyeball. And that's my idea. And I really think this is going to work. Imagine being, imagine being the first patient that this was going to be done to. Like, yeah, okay, so I have this idea. I know you're blind, but just bear with me for a sec. As this sounds ridiculous, but I want to take one of your teeth and I want to stitch it inside your eyeball and I think that you might see after that you you in i <laughs> especially the guy in the 1960s that agreed to this i mean granted the 1960s didn't have a lot of good medical treatment it's surprising like how how weird medical care was in the 1960s even though it wasn't too long ago like dentist didn't really start even using gloves until the 1960s which is wild like and we we knew about germ theory before that even so we knew about germ theory we knew that we we needed to wash our hands and things uh and they said yeah washing your hands is enough uh to to perform dentistry without gloves that's absolutely disgusting i don't know how people thought that was okay this next one we're gonna pull up is this is a, a very weird one, and I have a citation. We're actually going to read the article from the New York Medical Journal in 1880. So, for a long time, uh, we have known that if you bleed out, it's bad. You need blood to survive, and if you have too low blood pressure and too low blood volume, that you might, you might die. Uh, and 
there, there were times when they tried to use lots of different substances to transfuse into people to see if, uh, if they could keep people alive who were bleeding. And one of these things that they tried was human breast milk. Right, human breast milk. They used to take human breast milk and they tried this to uh, transfuse instead of blood if they didn't have blood available. Uh, so this is by Joseph W. Howe, MD, a professor of clinical surgery in Bellevue Hospital Medical College. And this is titled The Intravenous Injection of Human Milk. So this says, since my first experiments in the transfusion of milk, many attempts have been made in this country and in Europe to popularize the operation. Some have found it useful, while others, like myself, consider it a dangerous operation and one in which in no degree possesses the value of blood transfusion. So he did this experiment uh, and found no value in it, surprisingly, unsurprisingly. Notwithstanding my unfavorable unfavorable views of the operation, I experimented last year with human milk, thinking that it might possibly possess superior advantages to the milk of cows and goats. So they had already tried transfusing cow's milk into people's veins uh, and goat milk. And now they're like, well, you know, human milk is probably closer, so let's try that. The history of the case given below shows conclusively that human milk is no better than the milk obtained from any other animal and that the same unfavorable and alarming symptoms attend its use. Right, so uh, they tried this and it killed people, so we no longer do this. Louisa Raid, uh, estimated 25 years, a native of Italy, was admitted to Charity Hospital February 17, 1879, suffering from caries of the first and second ribs of the right side, caries of the first dorsal vertebra, and chronic catarrhal enteritis. So she had some chronic, probably some chronic bleeding from the intestines, possibly, possibly something like Crohn's or UC, maybe just a, a chronic enterocolitis. Uh, and I can't tell if they're referring to like osteoporosis uh, and having fractures related to osteoporosis in the vertebra in the ribs, or if she had some traumatic fractures, I, I don't really know. But we, we see that she has bone fractures and some kind of chronic enteritis. And uh, two large abscesses communicated with, disease, with the diseased bone. So she might have had... Okay, so she might have had the enteritis that had um, disseminated to the vertebrae and she had bone abscesses, so possibly some osteomyelitis of the, the vertebrae and the ribs, and she had lots of pus in her, in her abscesses. It sounds about right for an abscess, pretty gross. Uh, I'm very happy that we have less risk of this happening now. Um, tonics and stimulants were given with good effect for a few days. Uh, so probably she was given like cocaine uh, or something similar as a stimulant, um, which may have been used in in kind of a oppressor method. So if she had low b blood pressure and uh, this would be equivalent to in the ICU giving you norepinephrine or epinephrine or dopamine or something. Um, so that, that part might not be unreasonable that they would have used a stimulant uh, for someone who is very, very ill. Um, but it, was, it probably was cocaine, though. <laughs> Her appetite increased and the uh, separation diminished, so she got reduced swelling. Uh, this improvement, however, was only temporary. She soon began to sink from the combined effects of profu profuse diarrhea and separation. It was then decided to try the intravenous injection of human milk. So she was getting sicker and sicker over time. The stimulants were not enough to keep her from uh, losing blood and dropping blood pressure. So they decided what we have isn't working. Let's try transfusing some human milk. So they took a healthy woman who is obtained from the lying in ward of charity. So. Um, because somebody that was in the hospital who was healthier, they took three ounces of healthy milk 
drawn from the breast, strained through carbolized gauze, and placed in a basin of warm water. The cephalic vein of the right arm of the patient was then opened, and a double cannula of Collins' instrument introduced. The milk was then poured into the receiver, and the injection was commenced. At this time, the patient's pulse was ran up to 150, or at the time, the patient's pulse was 126 and a respiration 22. When the first half ounce had been thrown in, the pulse ran up to 150 and the respiratory movement to 30 to the minute. So she's already breathing fast. She's got a rapid heart rate because she has hypovolemia. Um, and they, so they gave her some more, some of the milk and her pulse went up higher, which is, I mean, she is potentially compensating more or having a negative reaction to this. So she's not going in a better direction. She complained, though, an interpreter, uh, through an interpreter of great pain in the back and limbs, which I've noticed before in other cases of milk transfusion. So they already knew that that was an issue with the cow's and goat's milk, and now it's also the issue with the milk trans human milk transfusion. With the introduction of the next half ounce of milk, the respiratory movements became labored and irregular, the pulse intermittent and at times almost imperceptible. The operation was temporarily suspended until these unfavorable symptoms had disappeared, and then another ounce was slowly injected. So, so she's getting worse. She's already dying. They're like, give her the, the breast milk. They inject it into her veins, and she gets worse. And so their plan then is to, to take a short break. Like, you know what? Okay, maybe we just need to slow this down a little bit. So they take a short break, and then they go back and and inject it again, because that's obviously the thing you need to do. When your treatment is not working and someone is getting worse, you obviously go back and do it again. So, so they gave her some more. The respiratory movements then ceased altogether and no pulse could be felt at the wrist. The cannula was drawn from the vein and artificial respiration produced immediately. In the course of five minutes of active effort, the pulse and respiration returned to an extent sufficient to warrant the removal of the patient from the amphitheater to the ward and the hypodermic injections. Uh, here we go. So this is fun too. Hypodermic injections of whiskey and morphine temporarily restored her lost vitality. So it didn't work. They al it almost killed her. They couldn't find pulses. They stopped doing the therapy for a bit, gave her some more, uh, and then she became stable enough, um, stable enough to move her to the ward instead of being in the OR, uh, and then, and then she stayed alive for a little bit after that by, because they gave her whiskey and morphine, um, <laughs> The patient lived 10 days after the operation. A post-mortem examination showed catarrhal pneumonia at the apex of the right lung, ulcerations in the large and small intestines with extensive necrosis of the bones previously mentioned. There were no lesions referable to the intravenous injection of milk. So they didn't find anything specific on autopsy that was caused by these uh, milk transfusions. Um, but yeah. This was not proven to be a good therapy. Uh, we don't do this anymore. And this is a reference to show why we don't do this anymore. Uh, if the cocaine doesn't work, try tits. Who was the doctor? Sigmund Freud? Uh, no, but Sigmund Freud did uh, was a proponent for um, a lot of drugs for certain psychologic therapy uh especially i think it was cocaine that he he endorsed specifically where is my article on it i have it somewhere um i have a lot of articles pulled up about things that people used to do i don't know but freud freud was very into lots of drugs for for psychological reasons oh yeah he was a big cokehead yeah yeah the next therapy let's let's go on to the the next one and we're going to talk about
let's talk about malaria and syphilis. So this is a very interesting one. All right. So imagine once again, you are a person in the 1850s. Uh, and, and this was apparently also used all throughout the late 1800s into the 1940s. Malaria therapy for the treatment of neurosyphilis. Uh, and this seems very weird. Um, there is some legitimacy here. So a refresher for people uh, about the mechanism of syphilis. You have three kind of main stages of syphilis. You've got primary syphilis where you get these uh, genital lesions and more of the presentation of an STI. Uh, secondary and tertiary syphilis, you start getting into um, cardiac disease, uh, d diseases of the aorta to make it look very rubbery or, or even leathery. Uh, you get neurosyphilis, so you get um, issues with sensation of the legs. Uh, so you get neuropathies, and you also get uh, some psychosis and other neurological symptoms. And this was a very big problem, especially uh, back in this time in America. And there was a lot of very bad medical malpractice done regarding the treatment of syphilis. And we're not going to touch on that because uh, that is worth its own episode about the injustices performed in the field of medicine throughout history and uh, what we can do going forward to prevent that kind of injustice from happening again in the future. But there was a therapy uh, for syphilis back in this time, and it goes off of the... The hypothesis that fever and high temperatures could kill off syphilis uh, bacteria, trypanema pallidum, could be treated by high temperatures. So, as a way to induce heat in these patients, uh, they would take malaria parasites and infect people with syphilis with malaria uh, because malaria, malaria, it, different types ha are different uh, cyclical fevers. Um, so there are some that cycle after one day, some that cycle after two days, some that cycle after three days. Uh, and so you get this re uh, re remitting fever. So the fever will go up and then it'll go back down and then it'll go up and down. And so this way they could control somebody's fever uh, and have it keep going and, and kill off the syphilis. And you can imagine that there were a lot of issues with this because you're giving somebody uh, another infection and we know that malaria is very dangerous and kills a lot of people. So you're kind of you're kind of stuck here because once you hit this this stage of tertiary syphilis, you're pretty far gone. Um, syphilis is a treatable condition. Nowadays with penicillin, it's very easy to treat syphilis if you catch it right away, which is why you should get tested if you think that you were exposed to syphilis. But if you're at this stage, uh, it is very difficult to stay alive. So you have this ethical dilemma of, do I let this patient die of syphilis, or do we risk them dying from malaria to potentially treat their syphilis? Uh, so it's kind of, how do you want to die? is is the question. So we'll read this abstract. For centuries, heat has been used in various ways for the cure of mental diseases. And it's unfortunate that they're primarily relying on this to relieve the psychiatric symptoms of neurosyphilis. Hippocrates noted that malarial fever could have a calming effect in epileptics. So I guess they used this therapy even back in ancient Greece for epilepsy. That's that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Centuries later, Galen described a case of melancholy cured as a result of an attack of quartan fever. In 19th century, the eminent French psychiatrist Philippe Pinel 
in his treatise on insanity referred to the beneficial effect of fever. An opinion is expressed a few years, years later by his pupil, Jean-Étienne Dominique, I, this, a lot of French names, in his treatise entitled, the, okay, that's, I'm not going to read the title either, that's more French. If someone speaks French and wants to read off the title of this treatise, you are more than welcome to. However, in 1917, the Austrian neuropsychiatrist Julius Wagner uh, pointed out the therapeutic value of malaria inoculation in the treatment of dementia paralytica. In 1927, Wagner received for this work the Nobel Prize in Medicine, being actually the first psychiatrist to win the Nobel Prize. He studied medicine at the University of Vienna and received his doctor doctorate in, 19, in 1880. In 1889, he was appointed professor of psychiatry. Uh, we don't really need to read up on his whole history of his qualifications, but he was a professor of psychiatry and a practicing psychiatrist. Working in the asylum, he noted that insane patients with general paralysis occasionally became sane after some febrile episode. After experimenting with several artificial methods, uh, they had tried streptococci uh, and tuberculin to induce fever. He concluded that malaria was the most satisfactory. Uh, actually, malaria infection was an acceptable risk for, for the patients, as quinine would be administered as soon as syphilis was cured. So they thought, well, the mal malaria is not that bad of a problem because we're going to give them the malaria, treat the syphilis, and then we'll give them uh, quinine therapy for the malaria and they'll be fine. Um, not really taking into consideration that not everybody could be cured by quinine. Uh, it's not 100% reliable of a drug, and no drugs are. Uh, and giving somebody both of these infections is going to be very, very risky. And especially if someone is already immunocompromised, you could see how, how bad this could have ended up. In 1917, he reported the first favorable results of this study. Patients were inoculated via intravenous injections with malaria. Some physicians were starting the administration of anti-syphilitic treatment, bismuth, salvarsan, and later penicillin after 10 to 12 febrile paroxysms, while others initiated the regimen the first febrile free day after eight malarial paroxysms. The therapeutic regimen was completed with the administration of quinine sulfate to terminate the malaria infection. It's worth mentioning that the above treatment was followed in hospital at, under the strict monitoring of patients' vital signs and regular laboratory tests. So at least they had doctors watching this. In the following years of his discovery, artificial fever was induced by any one of the following method, methods. The introduction into the patient of a parasitic disease, the injection of a foreign protein, injections of chemical substances such as sulfur. So they, they also injected people with sulfur as a means to cause fever. Electrical means, such as the administration of diathermy or radiotherapy, or placing the patient in an electromagnetic field, and simple immersion of the individual in a hot bath or placing him in a heat cabinet. So a, a sauna or hot bath uh, apparently was just as valid as injecting somebody with sulfur or putting them in an electromagnetic field or giving them a parasite. Uh, and this therapy was admired and used on neurosyphilis cases well into the 1950s. However, with the introduction of penicillin in syphilis treatment, fever therapy was effectively ended. Yeah, so this is very extreme. Um, it's amazing how they kept using this for so long. And I'm curious about the, the death rates. Oh, interesting. The Siffy or I don't know how to pr pronounce, but Siffy, uh, the syphilis channel. The inter that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I would much rather try the hot bath versus malaria therapy or sulfur injections. That's very dangerous. And I'm very happy that we've uh, discovered penicillin, but it is interesting that they kept using this even after the development of penicillin. Uh, so you have the treatment for syphilis, and people are still doing this uh, fever therapy. And thinking of all the different ways that you could cause a fever in somebody, any way that you're going to trigger inflammation, you can cause a fever. So, like, you could essentially vaccinate with 
something to to give them fever. Like if you took even a part of the malaria organism uh, and only use that and just didn't give them the malaria itself to, to just stimulate the recognition of not self and cause a fever, you could do it those ways as well. Uh, I guess now it's obsolete. We don't really need to do that anymore. Um, but if if this is shown to be legitimate, we could find some better methods to induce the same the same mechanism of treatment without giving somebody malaria. Uh, but this was an interesting one that I was wanting to share about. And then kind of this might be this might be the last one we talk about this time, because I think we're keeping today's episode a bit shorter. Um, I mean, we might go through a short list in. But uh, but I also want to do another episode on this potentially. We'll talk about a couple of them from the other list after we. After we talk about. Probably one of the biggest flaws of medicine in the past forever. And it is the technology of orgasm for the treatment of female hysteria. So we know, we know that for a long time, Women did not need to orgasm. They were not seen as being sexual beings. The only orgasm that mattered was the male orgasm. And I do want to do a separate episode on this concept up here earlier in the article, the androcentric model of sexuality. I do want to talk about that, but I'll, I'll briefly just mention kind of this for, for history purposes. So the androcentric definition of sex as an activity recognizes three essential steps, preparation for penetration, so foreplay, penetration, and male orgasm. And sexual activity that does not involve at least the last two, so does not involve penetration and male orgasm, is not, was not medically or legally regarded as real sex. So if the female was to orgasm, it was a plus. But if she didn't, then that didn't mean that it wasn't real sex. It was only the male's perspective that mattered. Um, and so for a long time, women have been seen as being hysterical uh, or having their cycles being the cause of, of their moods or them being irritable, etc. And we know that this isn't true. Uh, this is all based on the patriarchy and misogyny all of it and so what they would do um they did not want women to masturbate because they said that this practice would impair their health uh and so there's a lot of pseudoscience that that stemmed from this idea and they had thought that the orgasm, the female orgasm, was a way to treat the hysteria. Um, and they would have physicians that would essentially, uh, they would use a vibrator on the female patient to stimulate an orgasm, and then that would supposedly cure uh, her hysteria. And it's a very interesting. Like the thought process that went into this is very interesting because they had never thought that the female orgasm was even a thing. They're like, well, yeah, women can't actually do that. Um, and they they really medicalized the orgasm for women and it said that this was related to... I, I don't even know. I, I'm just going to read this paragraph and hopefully they will explain better about the the word salad and mental gymnastics that you get into when you try to explain why women are not sexual beings. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So this is a uh, hysteria as a disease paradigm from, uh, where is this article from? Johns Hopkins university press from 1999. So this is an older article. 
but we'll kind of we'll kind of read read through this. Uh, so this person says, I intend to sketch here the contours of male medical and technological response to discontinuities between male and female experiences of sexuality through the social construction of disease paradigms. Situated in the vulnerable center of every past and present heterosexual relationship, the potentially destabilizing issues of orgasmic mutuality have historically been shifted to neutral and sanitized ground on which female sexuality re was represented as a pathology, and the female orgasm, redefined as a crisis of disease, was produced clinically as legitimate therapy. So female sexuality was seen as pathology, and the orgasm was the crisis of the disease. So if you could get to the crisis of the disease, then you could treat the condition. This interpretation obviated the need to question either the exalted status of the penis or the efficacy of coitus, as a stimulus to female orgasm. Furthermore, it required no adjustment of attitude or skills by male sex partners. So part of the argument uh, presented here focuses on the vague and sexually focused character of hysteria as defined by ancient medieval Renaissance and modern medical authorities before Sigmund Freud. Many of its classic symptoms are those of chronic arousal, anxiety, sleeplessness, irritability, nervousness, erotic fantasy, sensations of heaviness in the abdomen, lower pelvic edema, and vaginal lubrication. The paralytic states described by Freud and a few others are rarely mentioned by physicians before the late 19th century. During the syncope, some hysterics were observed to experience. Franz Joseph Gall po pointed out in the second decade of, of the 19th century uh, and AFA King some 70 years later, uh, the subject's apparent loss of consciousness was associated with flushing of the skin, voluptuous sensations, and embarrassment and confusion after recovery from a very brief loss of control, usually less than a minute. So these people labeled as, as hysterics would occasionally pass out, uh, possibly. I'm I'm guessing and I'm wondering if the if this syncope related to hysteria was due to like heavy menstrual bleeding uh with people being anemic and going unconscious usually less than a minute that would make sense to me. Uh the hysterics did not become incontinent during their spells as epileptics did and apparently felt much better afterwards. Uh led some physicians to suspect their patients of malingering. Of course they did. Of course they thought they were faking. Doctors pointed out that epileptics often injured themselves when they fell, but hysterics rarely did so. Uh, I do not mean that all women diagnosed as hysterical were cases of sexual or rather orgasmic deprivation. Some were no doubt afflicted with either mental or physical ailments whose symptoms overlap significantly with the hysterical disease paradigm. See, I, I would suggest that like the majority of them had some kind of medical issue, but I mean, maybe... Maybe you had some women that really needed sexual activity and felt so ashamed in masturbation that they went to their doctors to do this for them. I wouldn't put it past them. I don't know if I necessarily uh, agree that, that this wasn't something med medically related primarily. So basically, uh, they got vibrators. Uh, the electromechanical vibrator invented in the 1880s by a British physician represented a last of a, the last of a long series of solutions to a problem that had plagued medical practitioners since, since antiquity. Effective therapeutic massage that neither fatigued the therapist nor demand skills that were difficult and time-consuming to acquire. Yeah, so previously, before the vibrator, I guess doctors and therapists would like their their job would be to to jerk off women uh to relieve their hysteria like that's that was somebody's like whole medical expertise which sounds very creepy looking back on it like think about the guys that would choose that that specialty but like yeah i'm choosing this uh to treat people's hysteria and this is a way to work in pseudoscience uh and sexual predation into 
uh, somebody's medical practice. And this is absolutely disgusting. Yeah, the vibrator was invented because the doctor's hands got too tired doing this. Um, I could imagine that some people did want this therapy uh, and enjoyed it. I'm also willing to bet that a lot of people were forced into this kind of therapy. And I, I really hate to think that that was the case for a lot of people. But yeah, this was an actual thing that, that they did. Um, and I don't want to go too far into this article because I, I do want to come back and talk about hysteria um, and, and the progress of our knowledge on the female reproductive system and the female orgasm. Because uh, I think it's a very worthwhile episode, but I, I do maybe want to get somebody who's an expert in uh, sex therapy or something that can help talk about this with me. Um, so we'll kind of leave that here. But let's look at, there is one other vagina myth that I did want to bring up because this was funny to me. Vaginal incense. So people used to use onions, I guess, onions, and they would put them into the vagina to make it smell better. Um, and there was a myth in ancient Egypt, apparently, that uh, onions were inserted into the vagina to determine pregnancy. So if, so if, <laughs> this is interesting. So it, if you put an onion in the vagina, uh, and then the woman's breath smelled like onions. That meant that she was pregnant. And that was something that they did back in ancient Egypt. Um, so if you did this, if you put the onion up your vagina and then ate an onion later, uh, you would be, have been thought to be pregnant probably because you would have smelled like onions. So don't do this. Do not put onions in your, in your vagina because it's number one. Uh, it's not going to be very easy to pull pull it back out. You need to make sure you're using safe safe toys that aren't going to get stuck places and also that aren't going to have uh, diseases. Uh, it, you don't want bacteria being shoved in there. So get something that you can sterilize effectively and onions cannot really be sterilized effectively. So please, please don't do this. And also... Um, Smelling like onions does not mean that you are are pregnant. But yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that Gwyneth Paltrow probably would have believed this. Yeah, it's more common that they that they peed on weed. But this whole episode is more about the weirdest things people did. And since onion vaginas was one of the weirdest things, I thought I would touch on it here. Uh, oh, and also this one was kind of fun that I, I'll cover and then maybe we'll, maybe we'll save the rest of these for another time. But back in the 1840s, uh, if for people who had trouble speaking or had, uh, voice disorders, they would cut part of their tongue off and say, yeah, this is going to definitely solve it. Um, it doesn't, we have things now, uh, we have speech therapists now that can work with people to help get their voices back. And there's no evidence that cutting off part of your tongue in any way affects your vocal cords, uh, especially not in a positive way. So please do not cut off your tongue if you get laryngitis. Uh, it's not, not a good idea. Um, it's just not a good idea to cut off your tongue at all. Uh, I don't recommend this. But if, if you are an adult and can make your own decisions, and can consent to whatever you want, then, I mean, if you really want to do it, like, if you really want to have half a tongue, then go for it, I guess. I'm not going to stop you. But I will say, there's no evidence to support this being a legitimate therapy. Oh, Nate, Nate Smith is here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, you cut off your tongue yesterday, didn't you? I told you to wait for this episode first before you went and got your tongue cut off. But uh, you apparently didn't get the memo, and I apologize. It's bad communication on my end. Um, so I think I think that's all the strange medical therapies we were uh, going to get into today. What was this other thing I had pulled up? Um, oh, this was about 
heroin. Yeah, I, th I think I had an article pulled up about heroin for uh, cough syrup. What the heck am I reading? Okay, I, I need to share this just because... Just because this article is weird. Um, hold on, this is funny. I'm going to zoom in uh, even more. It's it's hard to read, but I I don't know where this this is from a newspaper in Florida, not surprisingly, uh, in like eighteen eighty three or something. But I just glanced at this. There's something about syrup. I think I was looking up heroin and cough syrup. Uh, but it says just a word about patent medicine advertisements, and I'm done with this part of my subject. When I see a newspaper, especially a religious paper, advertising Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, the principal ingredient of which is opium, which is sold which in some countries labeled poison, and which is working untold harm to hundreds of thousands of little children who are dosed with it. When I see double column advertisements of hoods, airs, and other sarsaparillas, etc., which can contain a heavy percentage of alcohol, uh, fig syrup, peruna, liquazone, and other advertisements of the same character are interspersed with bar uh, bargains, hymn books, and Bibles for the saving of men's souls, then, then I am almost convinced that if there is no hell, there should be one created at once. So I guess not only were they advertising heroin for children with coughs, uh, but they were advertising heroin for children with coughs using the Bible and hymn books. To save people's souls. So if that isn't a good reason to remove religion from medicine, uh, I think we should remove religion from medicine. Do not do this. Um, oh, and we got some popping in. Hello, Dissonant Synth. I don't know if I've seen you in my... I might have seen you in my chat before, but welcome welcome to the fun. Yeah, and, and heroin would work, potentially, as a cough suppressant. Uh, we know that we know that codeine does, and codeine is has less psychological effects than heroin does, and and less respiratory effects. But I mean, if you're not breathing, if you're not breathing, you're not coughing. Uh, usually, so I mean, I guess the heroin could like it could be effective in small doses. Like, don't get me wrong, but it's very dose dependent, and, and the dosage required to kill you goes uh it's it's a pretty low doses to kill you so probably don't do this even though it might work this is technically valid oh and and breeze here now everyone's showing up and i'm just about to end because we have a very we're having a shorter stream today but does anybody i guess i could ask the audience if anybody else has a topic that you want to bring up or any questions or anything this is more of a casual episode today uh because i was feeling i'm not gonna lie i was feeling a little bit burnt out this week uh with a lot of the news in the with the trans community so uh that's why today is a bit less of a formal episode we are just talking about out there medical therapies that used to be done um but if anybody has any questions or comments or wants to say anything uh heroin ends all your ailments yeah yeah if you take too much heroin it could end your ailments and maybe that's why they put the the bibles and the hymn books in in their advertisements because people were dying with this therapy i don't know but it's interesting to see the the switch from back in the, those days when i guess they were using hymn books to advertise heroin cough syrup and then nowadays, uh, a lot of Christians would say that doing heroin is a sin, uh, and taking recreational drugs is, is a sin. So it's interesting that they had advertised for heroin with, uh, with Bibles. Oh, you give classes on treating hysterical paroxysm. That's awesome. Yeah, uh... 
I might I might get a panel or a few people to talk about uh, hysteria in that next episode. I don't know when I'm going to do that stream, but it's going to come at, at some point. You have a question. Uh, I yeah, I'm I don't know how much I can say about eating disorders because uh, I'm not a I'm not a psychologist. Um, you we can chat off stream though if you if you want to ask that privately I can try to point you in the direction of resources. Yeah, that's super cool, Bree, that you're doing that. Uh, and I think we're gonna wrap it up for now. Um, thank you everybody for joining today and for the people who are uh subscribed on on Twitch uh, or on the Patreon or a channel member, we're going to have the after show. I have it set for the usual after show time, but maybe we'll start it earlier since we're ending this earlier. Uh, so we'll see you all over there for the patrons. And thank you once again to Regios, Jody L, Pharmacy Sabrina, Ellipsis, Tons of Mice, Haney Ball, and SG for the patrons. And our channel member, Rebus Wynn, still our one and only channel member. I appreciate all of you and I appreciate everyone that supports the channel on Twitch as well. Um, so if you are one of those people, uh, I will see you in uh, the after show. And I think Phoebe might be joining us over there. We'll see. Uh, I'm hoping Phoebe will join us. But thank you, everybody. We'll see you all in the next one. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.